It's Christmas Eve in 2022, and Dan, a former sergeant currently working as a teacher, is supposed to be helping his wife Emmy and his daughter Murray with a party. Instead, he's on the phone trying to apply for his dream job at a lab, but unfortunately his application is rejected. After throwing a disappointed tantrum outside, Dan joins his daughter on the couch and reminds her to do what nobody else is willing to do. The family then watches an important soccer match, but the game is suddenly interrupted when a glowing cloud of smoke and electricity appears on the field and people start coming out of it. These people look like soldiers and they're led by Lieutenant Hart, who informs everyone that they come from the year 2051. An alien species known as the White Spikes have invaded Earth and most of humanity has been wiped out, so these soldiers are here to ask for people to travel to the future with them and help them fight the war. As months pass, countries all over the world send as many soldiers as they can, but it seems it's never enough, the future keeps asking for more people, and only a quarter of those who go come back. When they run out of trained soldiers, the government begins drafting civilians to join the fight. This causes riots on the streets because many people believe they shouldn't be sent to a war that doesn't affect them. Dan continues to work as a teacher, but his students don't seem too interested in what he has to teach because they don't see the point if they'll be dying anyway. The only exception is Martin, who is obsessed with volcanoes and always wants to talk about them all the time. At that moment Dan receives an important message on his phone, he's been drafted. Dan goes to the military facility and he's put through some tests that confirm he'll be able to join the fight because he'll be dead in seven years. Suddenly Dan feels a painful sensation on his arm and discovers they've put a metal device on his arm, he's informed that the device will keep track of him in the future. After seven days of touring, the device will bring him back. Afterward Dan goes to tell Emmy the news, and she immediately decides they should run away. Dan points out he can't get rid of a government tracker, so Emmy begs him to talk to his dad, who Dan hasn't seen since he was abandoned as a kid. Putting pride aside for the sake of his family, Dan goes to see his father James to ask for his help, but James thinks Dan was sent by the government to spy on him and an argument ensues. In the end, Dan has to leave with the device still attached to his arm. He returns home to give his family the bad news, but he also promises he'll be back. The next day, Dan goes to the training facility, where he befriends a scientist named Charlie and a fighter called Dorian, who is going back for his third draft. They receive basic training, which includes shooting and first aid, before they're given a full explanation of how the time travel technology works. The time link is similar to two rafts on a moving river, and a river can only move between those two points. That's why they can only travel between 2022 and 2051, those are the fixed points and they can't choose something right before the war. Sometime later, the trainees are resting in the barracks when suddenly the alarm begins ringing, it's time for them to leave. The trainees are confused because they were supposed to have seven days of training, but they're told the future can't simply choose when they need help. Once everyone has gathered, the time link is activated and a cloud like it appeared during the soccer match begins absorbing them into the future. They're supposed to be going to Miami Beach, but in the control room, something goes wrong with the output coordinates. The group appears in the sky right above the city and falls on top of a building, which causes many of them to instantly die. The remaining members manage to save themselves because they fall into a pool and they only have to swim out. The team looks down at the city of Miami and finds it in complete ruins. They don't know how to proceed, but at that moment they're contacted by a colonel, who informs them the city has been overrun by white spikes so soldiers are coming to completely bomb the place. The team's mission is to rescue a research team that is trapped inside a laboratory. The colonel knows Dan has experience in the military and puts him in charge of the team. Dan guides the team throughout the city, giving them indications of how to move properly and finding death and destruction everywhere they go. They find the lab building and when they enter it, they discover a dead alien, so Dorian takes a claw as a trophy. Further inside they find the research team, but they're all dead as part of an alien trap. The colonel asks them to retrieve all the copies of the research and to hurry because if there are bodies around, the white spikes will be back and the jet fighters are coming closer. The team rushes to pick up all the necessary items, then they start making their way downstairs as quietly as possible. However one of the guys hears a noise and when he looks up, they finally discover what white spikes look like. The alien shoots a spike from its tentacles, killing one of them, and the team immediately opens fire. Their bullets can't seem to damage the alien's thick skin, but at least it seems they can slow them down as they run down the stairs and find an exit hallway. The aliens kill and capture many team members on the way, so Dan stays at the back to defend them. Since his bullets won't work, he attacks with a fire axe, which isn't that effective either. Luckily Dorian comes to the rescue and kills the creature by teaching the team that the only weak spots are the neck and the belly. With lots of white spikes coming after them, the team runs down the streets until they find the tank that is coming to rescue them. Unfortunately the white spikes get to the tank first and destroy it. Now the team has no choice but to fight the aliens while at the same time trying to find cover. As more and more team members fall to the alien's attack, the survivors fall inside a tunnel, and Dan stops to rescue a fallen trainee. This delays the entire team, and two of the trainees decide to stay behind and act as a shield against the aliens so the rest of the team can run away. At that moment, the jets finally arrive and bomb the entire area. Hours later, Dan and Charlie wake up in a forward operating base in the Dominic Republic. 
They find Dorian, who informs them the rest of the team is dead and scolds Dan for having stopped to help a fallen person which put in danger anybody else. Dorian admits he suffers from cancer, and he's learned that he's the one that gets to decide when he dies. Their talk is interrupted when Dan is requested to see the colonel. When he hears another soldier refer to her by her surname, Dan is shocked to realize this is an older Murray. She grew up to be a scientist, and she's the lead researcher in the R Force, which she created herself. Murray explains she didn't bring Dan to see her father again, she actually needs his help with something, in fact she acts all cold and professional around him. Then she proceeds to show him the recording of a different looking white spike. All the aliens they fought in the city were males, and this one is female. She's more aggressive and much rarer, she also nests underground. The male white spikes will die to defend her because it seems all they care about is the survival of their species. The bombs the military use have a toxin Murray created, and so far it's been killing the male white spikes without issues. However the female alien survived that toxin, so Murray needs Dan to join the extraction team and capture a female white spike to be studied. Hopefully they can develop a stronger toxin that will kill the alien's main source of reproduction. The team gets ready and leaves in helicopters, where Murray tells Dan the story of what happened. The aliens showed up out of nowhere in Russia in 2048, somehow avoiding all satellite imagery and radar. It only took them three years to take over the world, and they don't care about material things, they just want humans as food. Dan wants to know what happened to him before he died, but Murray thinks it's better not to go down that road. Moments later, they arrive at the nest, where they find a bunch of soldiers trying to tie up the female white spike. The alien is furious and begins attacking the soldiers, killing lots of them. Murray joins them and lands a clean shot on her neck, giving the others the chance to put more rope around her and stop her from leaving. Finding herself caught, the female alien cries out to call for her protectors, and soon the area is swarmed with aliens. While the female tries to attack Murray, Dan comes down and shoots at as many aliens as he can before joining the others in the nest to help save his daughter. Together the soldiers push the female into the cage in a helicopter, but now the males are trying to attack the helicopters too to save her, even making one crash. Dan and Murray run to a jeep and start firing at the aliens to give the helicopters the chance to escape with the cage. Afterward the two of them drive at a great speed to escape the area. They stop at a beach to send an SOS flare, and Murray scolds Dan for acting without thinking. Dan just wants to protect her, but Murray doesn't believe him and explains he left the family when he was 12 because the depression of not working on what he wanted hit him hard. When she was 16, Dan was in a car accident, and Murray was at the hospital when he died. Murray is hurt by all this, and Dan has no words because he can't believe he became like his father. Suddenly he realizes he may understand James when he said that the war left him in a dark place mentally. The female white spike is taken to a fortified offshore oil platform, where the time machine is kept. She's chained and given a huge amount of sedatives every hour. Dan and Murray work together on analyzing the alien's DNA and trying to discover how she stops the toxin from killing her. It's a lot of work that takes them many days, but it also allows them to bond again and chat in a more friendly way while they share meals. The night before Dan has to leave he tells Murray that he's proud of her and that her mother would have been proud too. Dan tries to tell Murray she needs to rest and to give him more to do since he's supposed to be here to help after all. Murray takes the chance to finally explain why she bought him here, once she finds a way to make a stronger toxin. He needs to take it back to the past to mass produce it and get it ready for when the aliens arrive. That's why she's working like crazy to finish tonight, she needs to be done before he leaves. Dan doesn't want to leave Murray behind to her death, but Murray points out she called him because she's the only one she can trust. At that moment, the machine finally finishes a toxin with a 100% match for a female white spike, but it's also the moment the alien wakes up and calls for her protectors. As a bunch of male aliens arrives to attack the platform, Dan thinks they should kill the female to stop the attack but Murray points out they only have one sample of the toxin and it could help more in the past. While the soldiers begin defending the platform the best they can and many aliens crash into the labs, Murray and Dan run around the platform to try to make it to the helipad where Dan should be for the time jump, which will happen in a few minutes. The two of them shoot lots of aliens on the way, yet Murray still gets hit by a spike. Dan tries to help her walk, but she's in too much pain, and the platform is about to go down because the aliens crashed a ship against it. Murray apologizes for being cold to Dan and after saying she loves him, she gives him the toxin, urging him to take it back to save everyone. Suddenly an alien shows up and drags Murray down with it, causing Dan to jump after her to save her. However that's the moment when the time machine activates, and the time link takes Dan, Dorian, Charlie, and the others back to the past. Thankfully the toxin is safe in Dan's hand and the vial doesn't break. Charlie is fine, but he confesses he stayed hidden like a coward. Dan tells Hart they need to mass produce the toxin and send it to the future to kill all the aliens, but Hart is bad news, the time machine isn't working anymore, probably because the aliens on the oil platform have destroyed the other end of it. They can't go back ever again, meaning it's all over. Dan returns home and barely can believe he gets to be with his family again, he's still in shock because of everything he went through. At night he can't sleep, and he keeps visiting Murray to confirm she's alive. When Emmy checks on him, Dan shares what happened with older Murray, 
and he's still determined to find a solution to all this. Emmy helps him see the facts they have. They know the aliens attack Russia in 2048, but nobody sees the ships arrive. Maybe that's the year they start moving, but they arrive before, and nobody notices because it's in the middle of a frozen nowhere in Russia. So they need to start looking at years before that. The next day, Dan immediately jumps into action. He visits Dorian and convinces him this isn't over yet, then they take Dorian's trophy claw to the lab Charlie works at. Charlie confirms there's sediment on the claw that looks like volcanic ash that came from either China or Korea. They don't understand how Asian ash can end up in Russia, meaning they need to ask a volcano expert. Next Dan goes to see his student Martin, who explains there was a huge volcanic eruption in Asia thousands of years ago, if the ash was blown by the wind it could have gotten caught in Russian waters, which eventually became ice. This means the creatures have always been here on Earth, frozen under hundreds of layers of ice, that's why they never saw the ships arrive. The reason why they wake up in 2048 is that's when climate change finally finishes melting all the polar ice. They take this theory to the government, but since they don't have any proof, they aren't given the resources to find the alien nest. They need to do this the illegal way, and Dan knows just the right person, his father James, who has been living off the grid for years and has his own plane. Hearing Dan say I need your help convinces James to help with the mission, no matter how crazy it sounds. Dan also gets in contact with Hart, who worked with Murray in the future and is ready to finish her beloved leader's mission. Hart brings a few soldiers with her, plus plenty of weapons and some copies of the toxin. The team travels to Russia, and Charlie promises this time he won't hide. When they make it to the Academy of Sciences Glacier, they begin looking around the area for signs of anything strange. They stop when they discover their machines are going crazy because there's a weird magnetic field surrounding them. Using lots of explosives, the team opens a hole in the ground and enters an ancient cavern, where they finally find the frozen spaceship. Dan points out that entering the ship is extremely dangerous and they could go tell the government they've found proof, but everyone agrees the government has been useless and it's up to them to make things right. They use a chainsaw to cut through the ice and the team enters the ship while leaving Charlie and James outside in case something tries to escape. The group reaches the cockpit and realizes this is a crash site, the aliens never intended Earth to be their destination. Surprisingly the body of the pilot isn't a white spike. They go into another room and find the actual white spikes inside a series of biopods, which makes them realize their cargo, their bioengineered creatures that were used by the pilot's alien race as weapons to colonize other planets. The team begins injecting the pods with the toxin and watches the white spikes wriggling in pain, confirming the toxin kills them. However their cries also wake up the aliens that haven't been injected yet, causing them to break their pods and attack. The team shoots as many as they can, but some of them manage to escape. Dorian points out they have no choice but to blow up the ship, so he gives Dan his claw and accepts to stay behind to activate the bomb once everyone is out. James begins shooting at the aliens that escape, but Charlie's weapon gets stuck and he begins killing the creatures with a chainsaw. Dan makes it outside and warns them to run away while Hart and the others are swarmed by a huge colony of aliens. Not being able to wait anymore, Dorian makes the bomb explode, bringing everyone creature down with him and dying on his terms like he wanted. Dan, Charlie, and James get out of the cavern before the explosion hits them, but James explains he saw an alien with a red belly escape. Dan realizes that's the female, so they split up to go after her. The queen finds one of them and attacks, but it turns out it's a snowman covered in clothes that James put up as a trap. When the queen goes after him instead, Dan shows up to hit her with his snowmobile. Then father and son being shooting together until they push the queen off the edge of the cliff. They know she isn't dead yet though and get ready for her return. When the queen attacks again, she pushes them to separate them, then shoots a spike at Dan before going after him. Dan uses that same spike to stab her mouth and James uses the chance to hit her with an axe, leaving her blind. The queen begins thrashing around in desperation and Dan takes the chance to inject the toxin into her leg. However the queen removes that leg so the toxin can't spread in her body. When the queen tries to go after Dan, he gets a grenade ready to bring her down with him. But at that moment, James raises his wounded hand to make the alien smell his blood and go after him instead. Dan refuses to lose his father after they reunited, so he jumps on the queen and slices her neck with Dorian's claw. After hitting her a few more times, he takes out the last vial of toxin and inserts it in her mouth before kicking her down the cliff again. The queen crashes against a big rock and finally dies. The next day, newscasts all over the world report an explosion in Russia that killed a bunch of aliens, and the government tries to take credit for it. Dan returns home and reunites with his family, finally allowing James to meet his granddaughter. Now they can all work together for a better future.